I'll, I'll just bring you up to date as to RACAN itself. That stands for the Rochester Area Child Abuse Network. Uh, we are moving along in age. Um, we're about, oh, 14 years old now. We started in 2005. And um, we have been together giving presentations. This is our 45th presentation. That's not very many, but you must understand that we've had difficulty getting into churches. Uh, well, that was our major target. Our major objective was getting into churches, <clears throat> perhaps on the night that they dealt with either Bible study or social issues, mm -hmm. because we feel that the church doesn't tackle this. It's not going to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, simply because so many people um, who are involved in this on either side are in churches. They count themselves as church members, whether they are active in the sense of biblical involvement or not, uh, we don't know. But we do know that many people have been arrested for abusing a child uh, who profess to be members of churches. So that's one of the reasons why we uh, zeroed in on churches from the beginning. Another reason was that uh, pretty much what I said, church is a social as well as a spiritual institution and as such it has people within it who should be guardians of children. God expects for Christians to have the responsibility of watching over everyone who is oppressed, everyone who is suffering, everyone who is poor, everyone who cannot speak for themselves. That's why, one reason why the church was instituted is to be the voice of God in the world. Uh, unfortunately, that hasn't happened too often, and as a result, the church has found itself mired in the same predicaments as the world has been. We're trying to Amen. deal with that as well, trying to change some of that so that we can really focus on uh, children being oppressed and being uh, being attacked, being assaulted, being abused. There are many forms of sexual abuse, but we concern ourselves with only two. Physical child abuse, sexual child abuse. But we uh, are predominantly concerned with the sexual abuse of a child. S destroying the innocence of a child. Mm -hmm. Taking the child out from being a child to being in a situation where they have a traumatic experience that does not disappear with age. It sticks around until something happens to give that person the opportunity to vent all that has happened to them that it has not been their fault. Uh, churches certainly stand in position to help with this through sermons and through teachings and through encounters. Um, but we are concerned with children because that statistic continues to rise, it continues to stay, it continues not to decimate any. If, if, if there were 4,000 children from Monroe County who were abused last year, and that's not the real figure, the real figure is much higher than that, but if this time, this year, right now, looking back last year at this time, but there were 4,000 this year, this time, this year you have 6,500. What's going on? What's going on? It is not being treated, it is not being addressed, and it is not being handled properly. Um, so, RACAN was a combination of black churches, a combination of white clergy, a combination of law enforcement personnel, and a few other agencies that dealt with children particularly the city school district. Mm -hmm. The city school district came to only two meetings, and that was in 2005. We have not heard from them or seen from them, or seen anything from them since. Mm -hmm. So we're just moving on with whoever we can get to come with us to these meetings who are trained and who are able to talk to people, just talk to people about what is going on with our children. Mm -hmm. I say our children because Every child belongs to us. Yes. Doesn't matter where, doesn't matter who the child is, doesn't matter the child's color, doesn't matter the child's ethnic background, That's doesn't right. matter the child's state of wealth. 
they belong to all of us. And therefore, when one child is abused, when one child is put through a suffering trauma, we all must suffer that mm -hmm. in order to understand how we should deal with a person that has gone through hell. Mm -hmm. um, some of us has gone through that. And that's the thing that I can't quite grasp. Why, how a person can go through all of the sufferings and mismanagement of humanity mm -hmm. and remain silent. Mm. Even though they're through with it and they were innocent, yet they do not share <clears throat> what has happened to them. What has happened to them is happening to many of our children, yes. no matter where they are at. I'm not, I'm not really zeroing in on Catholicism because I, I respect that faith. It's an old faith. It has been around and has produced many, many good people. But the terrible situation that we are reading about now in terms of Catholic clergy who have abused children, well, the same thing is happening in non-Catholic churches. Mm -hmm. Non-Catholic churches. It just so happens that um, the Catholic church is an easy target simply because it has a lot of money and it has distributed a lot of money with respect to various claims against its clergy. Um, those of us who are from Rochester and who know the educational history of a school like McQuaid, well, we, 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 it's hard for us to believe, knowing some of the people that have gone through that school who may have been abused by many of its professors as children. But nonetheless, McQuaid is one school but we're dealing with a million others. Mm -hmm. So that is, where, that is where it's at. Now, in terms of crime, child abuse, let's put child abuse and the domestic violence practice against women. Both were never considered to be crimes. Never. Until most recently. You could beat up a woman, and then the police officers who would come and investigate would just merely take a, take a walk. It didn't matter how bad the woman might be injured. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally speaking, it would fall back as to her being the catalyst of it all. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, maybe not. Uh, the thing with children, it has only been of, of, of recent vintage when children have been killed that the law has begun to look at these circumstances and the circumstances against women and have raised it from a, from, from a no crime, from a misdemeanor, now fortunately through a felony. Governor, Governor Cuomo just a, a week ago passed the uh, Children's uh, Act that uh, at least is waiting to be signed by him, but uh, he's the one that put it forth, but it is going to take a hard stand against those who abuse children, mm -hmm. harder than it is now. Uh, that has to occur, but let us remember that we have lawmakers who are child abusers, mm -hmm. we have judges who are child abusers, right. mm -hmm. we have police officers who are child abusers. Mm -hmm. The persons who commit these crimes, they're, 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 they're just, it's just endless. Yes. Um, and it seems as if the educated class, not the poor class, but the educated class of people are the ones mostly involved in these things. Teachers, counselors, coaches, yes. all of these people who have a direct contact with children, Sunday school teachers, yes. Bible study teachers, amen? Mm -hmm. Oh, I forgot. Right, where is that? Yeah. You're in the church. Uh, church. church. You're in a church. Uh, but all of these, all of these, all of these attacks against children come from people who basically we trust, people whom we know, mm -hmm. people that we would not hesitate under the right kind of circumstance to have our child sit underneath their feet to yes. learn, mm -hmm. uh, to be taught. Uh, but it's a shame that we have to deal with it mm -hmm. in this manner. Now, I'm sure that um, Reverend Evanger is going to share with you, if he hasn't already, yeah. some of the things we should look for in a child uh, who's all, very suddenly, practically everything that they've done, is, you can see some change in it. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that should call us, even if we're wrong, even, that's better than not being uh, involved at all, not saying anything at all. It's best to say it, even though it, it might not end up the way that we had thought it might, fortunately, but at the same time, it's best to say it than not to say it. Um, but here we go with children. 
Here we go with children who are abused at home physically <coughs> or verbally. Here we go with children that are hungry, dealing with children who are poor, children who walk to school in near zero weather with little on. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about children who are very vulnerable, children who do not get the love and the respect that they need to get at home, mm -hmm. children who are not treated as children ought to be treated at home with families, mm -hmm. children who are abandoned, children who just exist, they just survive. They are vulnerable, very, very vulnerable to the depredations of a child abuser who seeks a child, who plans the child for the child's um, uh, overtaking, and who lays out everything before a child to keep them quiet. But this child abuse, the sexual child abuse, is a horrible crime, and I think I think it should be dealt. This is me, but I think it should be dealt as the most heinous crime in American society, next to killing. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be really persons who commit crimes against children should pay the ultimate price. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I, I try hard yes. to be a preacher, mm -hmm. and I try hard to let grace control me. And I know the wisdom there is behind forgiveness. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that I have difficulty with, I still do, that is I cannot treat a child abuser, a known child abuser, abuser, a pervert, with the same kind of Christian charity that I would treat anyone else. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for me. Mm -hmm. And to say that you can forgive, a, you, there's some things that we can forgive, we can forget. <clears throat> But the one thing that I find it very difficult, very, very difficult to forgive is a person who assaults a child, who would dare take advantage of a child, to rob that child basically of their life because of this type of situation. And oftentimes it's done by family members, oftentimes it's done by fathers, stepfathers, boyfriends. Mm -hmm. But we have to be very, very careful who we entrust our children too. Mm -hmm. um, I wish that there were some way in which this crime could be more strongly acknowledged. We do have people who are noted internationally who are now stepping forward and saying that when I was 11 years old this happened to me, this, that, and the other. And that is good. That is good. Um, knowing that we have people now who are willing to talk about it and to expose the crime. Uh, that helps people who are just viewing them, helps people who are just uh, know, who just know about them, just know about their theatrical and whatever else uh, they're into. We know about that life, but this, it stuns us, it surprises us that this person has come forward and admitted that as a child they were abused. They were, that takes courage, mm -hmm. takes courage. And we should deal with each situation like that with as much compassion as God would give us because that is a horrible, terrible crime. Mm -hmm. um, one, of our, one of our presentations at a church some time back, um, a woman was there, and this was a good crowd. This was a storefront church, and they had about 30, 35 people there. Mm -hmm. Well, she was silent through all the presentations, and then at the end, when the pastor asked her any further questions, she spoke up. And she said, when she was eight years old, she was abused sexually. And it continued until she was 10 or 11. And she had sat on, she was now, she looked to be in her, at least her mid 60s. And she was saying, for almost all of my life, I have never told anybody, not even her pastor, mm. about this situation. She said, and now I feel that I'm free because now I realize that it was not my fault. And as a result of that, that's what we call, um, uh, what's the term we use? There's a term that we use whenever that, uh, a disclosure. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's what we really, that's not part of what we, plan, but that's part of what we wish for. Every time we give a, uh, uh, have an opportunity to give a, a presentation, we plan, well, what, that's a joyful thing. Simply because that's a person that's been set free. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
unless we're set free from anything, our sins, you know, we continue to grope. But once our sins are forgiven, we don't grope anymore. No need to. Mm -hmm. Because you know that God has our future in his hand. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Uh, just a quick uh, question, uh, yeah. sir. Um, when you mentioned about <clears throat> who we entrust our children to, um, as adults, the children are children. You know, they're just innocent to a certain age. They're just mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. They might be a little rambunctious. They might test your wills as mm -hmm. adults to nth degree because they know all the buttons to push on you. But they're just kids. But as adults, <clears throat> it's it really bothers me to think that we live in such a society that these people are out there. And how do we how do we as adults trust? It's very difficult. That's a very that, difficult that, question. That is a, a a bond that is that mm -hmm. is when it's broken, it's broken. It's broken. And mm -hmm. how as adults, how do we trust? our kids to our school teachers, our pastors, if we know all this stuff is going on out there. One of the things we have to do though, we have to, we can look back and we can see where we were not as diligent as we needed to have been and then we can correct those aspects that we know that we have made mistakes with in the past so they no longer are, are, are available in terms of actually happening again. That will draw us closer to our children and also give us the ways in which we can approach the child with respect to certain questions about anybody. How did they do uh, in school today? Any problems today that you've had? And if they say no, then they haven't had any problems. That means they've had a problem. Uh, basically speaking, a child is always going to say no. <laughs> when I was with big brothers and big sisters, I never a volunteer would say they they'd pick up the child and the child would have the mouth kind of stuck. I'd say, what's the matter? He'd say, no. And that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. But so we have to probe. We really have to probe with children and be sure. We can, and I think that we just need to be more of an umbrella over our children. Don't give them too much freedom. Mm -hmm. I worry a lot about technology. This uh, Internet. What do you, yeah. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't get on any of that stuff. I, ha I have an email. The only reason I have an email is because my daughter bought it for me <laughs> for my birthday about eight years ago. She's the one that taught me how to do the emails. I don't want to know about Facebook. I don't know about Instagram. I don't know about any of that stuff. Because people get up there and they lie. Mm -hmm. uh, they tell their life story mm -hmm. or they attack people. They curse. And I don't want to hear all that stuff. So I'll go, out, I go out in the hood and I can. See, we have to. Yeah. Yeah, but we have to. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm thinking. You we have were talking, to? Yeah. We, oh, yeah. Well, yeah. we were talking about with Reverend oh, yes. <clears throat> Jim. Jim, thank you. Mm -hmm. With Reverend Jim, before you came in, um, what I'm going to, let me just also say, this is my professor. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was at Colgate Rochester Crozier Divinity School, they had a program called Black Church Studies, which is now called the Howard King Thurman um, School for a certificate, if you wanted to take a certificate. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Walker is a, a close friend of my grandfather, Bishop Julian R. Cox, and my grandmother, because I always give grannies little nuggets, mm -hmm. who's doing well, and I'll let her know that you are that you um, said hello. And um, in addition to that, he taught black history, so I'm going to ask you to come back and give us a little sure. class on that as well. Um, but we were talking before you came about uh, the single parents now, and us, those of us who have school-age children, even the grandparents, who some, some grandparents are disconnected from the media devices, but now this is another inlet for child uh, predators mm -hmm. to come in on through these devices. And so I'm thinking about holding another seminar mm -hmm. about how to address and how to go with that. And there's another thing that is also called um, where they have a social withdrawal, like social media withdrawal, internet withdrawal. Like mm -hmm. if you take the device from oh, the child, yeah. they completely <laughs> collapse and go <laughs> off and go crazy. And what it is is that the endorphins are, you know, they have this, this exposure to an extended amount of stimuli, just like getting high on a drug. And then when you take it from them, 
they completely go to to yeah. to fall apart. So I don't want to take away from that, but this is something that is. Um, I was able to work with Dr. Walker. I believe it was in 2005 when Ray Can first started, and we mm -hmm. were in the um, basement at Enon, um, where uh, I was able to work with him. Now that I have my own church, <laughs> I'm going around full circle to bring that same spirit back to our church and hopefully host these quarterly um, during the year. So that way, if you know people want to come, people who missed the first one, or maybe they want to come and, and allow this ministry to grow, at least here for us. Um, so that was one of the things that we um, we wanted to do. And we just had gotten to slide number five about getting the parents and guardians who are experts to the Bavona Child Advocacy Center. I'm recording everything. Oh. So... <laughs> Speaking of technology. This yeah. is technology. Yeah, this technology. is technology. Smart. Because we want people, even though the one thing that I'm finding is that when we host these type of events, we're only getting the people who are not necessarily on social media yes. to actually show up. However, if there's a way that we can get these presentations on social media, mm -hmm. then we can do just what, like, this is where we started. Be mm -hmm. wise as the serpent yes. and use the serpent's tactics. Yes. Okay. Against yeah. him, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. All right. So, so go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. I'm just saying. I, you know, I don't have you. emails. Fine. Oh. Okay. Uh, the rest of the stuff, fine. I leave that to y'all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I do. I did read this morning where the police are saying that one of the dangers that parents need to look out for online and stuff. Mm -hmm. yes. And so there, there are agencies like uh, law enforcement officers who would be more than thrilled to come in and talk mm -hmm. to the group about how mm -hmm. uh, the technology is being used. Now, one of the things that I learned as a member of RECAN is the fact that um, he's no longer with us. He's now in Florida, but um, his name was uh, uh, Crow, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, he was an officer in the uh, Monroe County Sheriff's Department. He was successful in getting in um, the Monroe County Sheriff's Department, um, a, a, tele a series of televisions, I think three, where they have people sit beside them. That's all they do all day and all night is look for mm -hmm. uh, a, a child abuse situations. <clears throat> and they're able to, and that's a, this online contact mm -hmm. uh, that they're talking about, uh, and they've been able to make actually arrests uh, locally with respect to that, that that device by having a policewoman pose as a person of yes. the street mm -hmm. and um, that's how they close in on it. Mm -hmm. Or that they just by simple telephone call saying they meet me someplace, I'm 10 years old or I'm 11 years old, I'm 12 years old, and the guy goes for it and, he go, and then he's arrested right there mm -hmm. on the spot. Mm -hmm. So there are some aspects of technology that I certainly do applaud as long as it zeroes in on destroying the evil that uh, we perceive that was part of this uh, thing we call uh, <coughs> child abuse. Uh, but uh, a lot of the things, to answer your question directly, a lot of the things that is going to help are just things that we do, mm -hmm. that we no longer permit ourselves to do. You know, like parents used to send the children to the corner to get some, to the corner store. Mm -hmm. Corner store might be just across the street. Mm -hmm. We never know what's going to happen to a child mm -hmm. between the time they leave the door until they get over the store and get back. Some will never return, or some yes. are found many months later mm -hmm. elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have to be very, very cautious. I'm very ca I have a 12-year-old daughter now, Asia, mm -hmm. and I, even though she's a big girl, uh, she still has to go about 75% of a block to where her bus picks her up at school. I'm out there every morning with her. Six o'clock, well, not right. six I wake her up at six o'clock. She has to get on the bus at 648. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm out there with her so that uh, I know she's on the bus. Right. And I'm right there as often as I can when I'm working to see that she gets off the bus when she's supposed to. Mm -hmm. uh, simply because you just can't take chances. You just can't. I actually work at my daughter's school. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and like you said, changing, um, it's about the communication. You've yes. got to have conversations, yes. no matter how uncomfortable yes. it is with our children. At an early age, I, yeah. I, you know, I have my four-year-old granddaughter, and we have the conversation. That's right. And she knows who's supposed to touch what, when, where, mm -hmm. how. And then I was telling her the other day, I said, ain't nobody going to. So I told her, she said, I said, even if they tell you, they're going to kill her. I said, look at Grandma. 
nobody gonna mess with Nana. Yeah. And she was like, no, Nana, ain't nobody gonna mess with you. <laughs> so that's the conversation. She's not afraid of somebody, you know what I'm saying? Yes, but sir. they get that fear. And so they, so I told her, I said, ain't nobody gonna mess with Nana. So now she knows if somebody messes with her, she feels <laughs> freedom right. in knowing and, and she'll come tell, mm -hmm. you know? Yes. And it's unfortunate that we have to have that conversation with our babies. That's mm -hmm. right, but it's necessary. It's necessary. It's necessary, yes. I have a three-year-old daughter, <coughs> and I um, I went to school for health education. So I'm basically certified to be a health educator, but I choose not to work in schools. I work in community agencies. I don't do that work right now. I do something a little bit different, but that's my passion. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking about starting, like having my own business uh -huh. of doing health education. Uh -huh. So my daughter, um, I've always wanted her to learn this stuff for different reasons. Uh -huh. um, as a sex, sexual health educator, I'm passionate about this and bring it into the church. Uh -huh. And for me, I go to a church, I try to bring a topic in because um, when I was doing a curriculum, when I was working for an agency, it was pregnancy prevention. Mm -hmm. I know as a church, they say, you know, don't have sex before you're married. But 2019, it's happening. It's happening. It's happening. It's happening. Listen, the majority of black churches have single women. Mm -hmm. A lot of them. Mm -hmm. We can't be naive. Right. Because they're human beings. Mm -hmm. We can't be able to say they're they're not sexually active. Mm -hmm. You know, you have, we have to build within the church not only structures like you like you just mentioned, but we have to be able to say why. And I'm, and we one of the things we, we 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 have not been taught emphatically over the years, over the decades, over the centuries is the fact that we are human and we have instincts, we have drives, we have hunger. Mm -hmm. We have sex. Yes. We have other kinds of drives that are that we feel are necessary, necessary for our psychological well-being, necessary for our health. Certainly, food. Uh, and how we can deal with that is the way that God would want us to look at it and deal with it. Right. Deal with it forthrightly and don't try not to mention it. The thing that hurt, hurt has hurt us is the fact that people have been scared of that three-letter word, mm -hmm. sex. They say, ooh, ooh. Mm -hmm. ooh. And they, you know, they, they, they try to avoid it. <laughs> they say, try, try they say different, it. Yes. different things. They try to avoid any kind of contact mm -hmm. that was, or I'm sorry, not contact, any kind of situation where you, you're going to talk about this. And, I, you know, when I preached my first sermon on, on, on human sexuality, I received reports from my deacons that members of college said, I shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then you know what that did for me? I just said I should do this more often. <laughs> you know, that, you know. Let's do a series. Yeah, really, really. Let's get down with it. Yeah, but you know, it's the fact that they had not been taught. They've been taught that sex is bad. Uh -huh. You know that the feelings are wrong. That if you're a Christian, you shouldn't have this desire. Well, that's not quite right. You have to read and understand. What's the term that you use? I've heard you use it. Um, you have to. Um, What's the term? Uh, discernment. discernment. You have to have discernment. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. That is the knowledge that God gives all of us for any kind of situation right. that we're in through the power right. of the Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. So we'll know exactly what's up and what's down, yeah. what's that's to right. the left, what's to the right. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what we have to do. But at the same time, we must always, always share with children that they are not with them unless they, you know, they just tell them, you know, don't disturb this jar of peanut butter because it has not been opened yet and I do not want to come in this pantry and see a knife full of peanut butter on the sink board. Yes, Daddy. But when you come into the pantry, what do you see? You see the jar of peanut butter, the top over here, and a knife full of it. And you say, who did this? And said, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't now, know yeah, right. <laughs> but that, that's a different. But when, when it's a situation uh, where you really need to sit down with a child and talk seriously with them, 
Don't think that because a child is four or five or six years old, they cannot carry on a serious conversation, but they can. And that's where child psychologists miss the point. Mm -hmm. But we talk to children as best that we can talk with them without laying any kind of guilt on them, without laying any kind of fault on them, just through exploration. Yes. You know, just tell me what you did today. And if, the more we do it, the better we become. Yes. Right. Uh, so we, we'll, we'll learn how to do it. Could I, could I ask you all a favor? Mm -hmm. Could you give me about two or three minutes? I see you have a restroom there. I gotta go. Sure. Yeah. Well, he was going. Can he finish some of his slides? Oh yeah, you can finish some of his slides. I'll be right out. You're just on the surface. You're just in Genesis. Now you know why he's Moses. <laughs> okay. So this comes back to a question you asked earlier. Number six. The question was, um, you know, what do I do with the fact, here I am male, um, I'm older, I'm in a church leadership role, and it's a young child, it's a female child who's coming forward to me. How do I handle that? That's a wonderfully sensitive question. I actually wrote this for the opposite. <laughs> for your peer who thinks I'm going to handle everything. Mm -hmm. So my sixth do not is do not exceed the scope of your competency or your skills or your gifts. Mm -hmm. If you don't know trauma symptoms, mm -hmm. if you don't know what trauma-informed care is, mm -hmm. if you do not know clinical interventions, and if you are not a child therapist, then don't counsel. Right. I know that Paul says, I was all things to all people. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean he tried to take care of their medical needs. He was talking about for the sake of their salvation. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we have some congregations that close in upon themselves and the leadership, clergy, trying to do everything all on their own. Mm -hmm. If I go to my <clears throat> pastor and I say, you know, I'm just, I'm really beaten down, I've got a fever, I've got aches and chills, she's not going to say, let me pull out my stethoscope and give you a physical exam right. and pull out my Bible and write you a prescription. She's going to say, well, have you seen a doctor lately? Do you have a doctor? And don't sneeze on me. <laughs> <laughs> She's not going to exceed the scope of her competence. Right. So, to get back to John's question, then what do you do? He recognizes, I may not be the most appropriate person to deal with this child. So what do you do? Do you rely on professionals and people who are sensitive to ACEs? Have you ever yep. heard of ACEs? Yep. Yep, I just recently was at the, um, it's called Resolve, is one of the, at the, um, it's called Intimate Partner Violence at the seminar I just went to, and uh, we just learned about ACEs. So you're nodding your head, correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, ACEs came out, remember I said I work from evidence-based literature, like health studies? The ACEs study came out of a great big health company, health insurance company in California. It has national significance. An ACEs adverse childhood experience, and I'll get to that in a minute. The point to John's question is you refer that kid, that family, to somebody who can provide the resources. What is the biblical basis for that? Think about Miriam. Now, this is a Sunday school curriculum picture. They don't get much more stereotypical than this. It doesn't show up real well, but here's Moses in the bulrushes, right? Mm -hmm. So, who's this? Is that the Pharaoh's daughter? That's the Pharaoh's daughter. That nice blue, right? Mm -hmm. And then here are the various attendants in the background. Mm -hmm. Their robes are not quite as colorful. Hiding 
Here is Miriam. Mm -hmm. Who's Miriam? That's Moses' sister. sister. Moses' sister. Mm -hmm. So what does the Pharaoh's daughter know that she cannot give this child? Milk. Milk. So what does Miriam say? I'll nurse him. No, she says, I'll get the mother. Oh, Miriam. Miriam I'm gets here. the birth mother. Oh, the birth mother. Now, she doesn't tell the Pharaoh's daughter that she's going to get Moses' mother. But she says, I know a wet nurse. I know somebody. I know a wet nurse. It's Miriam who connects the kid in need with the appropriate resource. Mm -hmm. Miriam doesn't do it all herself. Right. The biblical basis says it's okay to get help. So... In the case of a church leader where the disclosure is made, he knows his limits, he recognizes the kid may not be comfortable talking to me, okay, good. But he can say, I'll pray for you, I'll pray with you, I'll go with you. When I send you to Vivona, I'm willing to go with you if you want that. That's what church leaders do. Right. He could say, you know, I've heard about this place called Bivona. I've never been there, but here's what I'll do. I'll go check it out for myself, and I'll tell you whether I'm comfortable with it. There's a lot of ways to stay within your role and be supportive without trying to solve the kid's problem. All right. Okay? So... In this ACES study, they examined, uh, they went to their health records, all these patients that they treated for years and years, both men and women. And they went back, and then they sent out a survey and said, did you have any of the following? Three categories of adverse childhood experiences. I'll start over here. Household dysfunction. Now, this kind of gets back to what the pastor was talking about earlier, uh, interpersonal violence. Mm -hmm. um, mother treated violently. Substance abuse in the home. Divorce in the home. Mental illness. Oops, sorry. I'll go back. Uh, mental illness in the home or an incarcerated relative. That affects a kid. <coughs> Another form of an adverse childhood experience is physical neglect and emotional neglect. Mm -hmm. All right? And the third category was outright abuse. Physical, emotional, and what I'm focusing on is here is sexual. So they got responses. This is what happened to me. And then they started correlating that information with the health histories of all those people. This is how I deal with technology. <laughs> <laughs> so what did they find? What happened to these people over time? If they had an adverse childhood experience, it disrupted how they process things. It disrupted how they think and how they feel. That impaired their social life, how they related to others, their emotional life, being anxious or being fearful, and their cognitive impairment. It affects how the brain works. We know that with veterans returning from war. We know that from people who have been tortured for political reasons. We know that through domestic violence. We know that those kind of problems show up. Do they show up the same way in everybody? No, of course not. Everybody's different, people have different strengths, different support systems, but we know that there are effects. That leads to health risk behaviors. Mm -hmm. When I was talking about that Methodist investigation of the kids who were abused on the mission field, it's really sobering have somebody tell you, I was in so much pain, the only way I could release my pain was to cut myself. 
mm. so that I did not feel the pain of being sexually abused by a missionary. And then show us her scars. All right? That's a health risk behavior. The abuse of substances, be it alcohol, drugs, what have you. Acting out behavior. Sexually acting out. Which leads to long-term disease, disability, social problems. And they found that people with adverse childhood experiences were also at greater risk for an early death. That's significant stuff. I was only going to say that part of that early death is also suicide. Yep. Yep. And my Jesus says, I come that you have abundant life. Mm -hmm. This is not abundant life. Right. Can I? Which is, oh, just to reiterate, this is why I'm looking for people who are competent dealing, recognizing this stuff and dealing with it. If I brought this book, um, one of the people who helped really the medical community begin to deal with this is a woman named Judith Herman out of Harvard Medical School, Trauma and Recovery. Mm -hmm. um, this book is widely available. You can get it out of the library. No, I was just going to make a quick um, correlation, and I didn't want to take too much out of your thing, but, um, and Dr. Walker would be so proud of me. I published my dissertation, and so on page 69 and page 70, if you guys look, I think it's on 69 and 70, there's a, a significant correlation between this particular uh, ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences, and Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs Theory. Because every time one of Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs Theory, do you see the graph? Is it a graph yes. right there? Yes. Every time one of Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs Theory is not met. So you have at the bottom, you can see the physiological, right? So those are the actual childhood experiences. But when you start getting into those psychological experiences, you start to see where if those needs are not met, mm -hmm. then these, neuro these neurological development is disrupted, the social and cognitive, and then it goes up to that self-actualization. Do you see that? Yes. So when that's not met, that's where you get that early death, the disease and disability and social problems and things of that nature. So these are two pyramids. I hope that's not too much of an interjection, but these are two pyramids that are, if you make the correlation, when you start to see these, you know that there's a need that is not being met. Is that fair? That makes perfect sense. Because <laughs> Maslow is talking about the healthy development exactly. of a person over their life. Exactly. Whereas this is talking about the painful development. Exactly. I, they're like mere opposites. Exactly. I, that's brilliant. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> so the adoption of health risk behaviors. Mm -hmm. You mentioned acting out sexually. How do you differentiate between that situation or the survivor, victim, whatever you want to call it, is doing this and yet they get arrested um, or the other person, if it's prostitution, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how that, that fits because the police officer or whatever is going to come into the situation, they're not going to know all of the the history of this person. You know, it depends on the officer. I agree, in general. Mm -hmm. Law enforcement, the legal system is not set up to deal with this. Right. Mm -hmm. one, one of the fortunate things in our community, uh, it's slow, but there it's are slow. changes that are occurring. So right. for example, now in the county court system, there is a veterans court mm -hmm. where they recognize these are the presenting sy symptoms and yeah, we can deal with them in terms of breaking the law, 
But let's get to the root of the issue. Right. 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 Post traumatic okay. stress disorder. The, right. <laughs> if if Clifton Manns, Joshua, were here today, he can tell stories about he is an officer uh, getting involved with. Um, he has one particularly vivid incident. I think it's over by Wilson. Um, a teenager on the street, a, a girl, just really enraged and he is doing all he's a muscular guy he played football um, he's a muscular guy and he talks about how he's trying to restrain her he's been trained in how you deal with people who are physically upset he's doing all he can to restrain her and he's asking her what's the problem what's the problem the in terms of children, um, one way that children act out having been sexually abused. See, I'm coming back to mm -hmm. the topic. Yeah. The, the disclosure. Disclosures can be indirect. So mm -hmm. a kid is playing with dolls, mm -hmm. and this doll is humping the other doll. That's not the way the kids play with dolls. Right. Mm -hmm. Or a kid has been exposed to pornography, mm -hmm. and the kid is acting out what they saw on the right. tape or you know whatever. A kid is using language that kids don't use. Right. I mean, there's a difference between picking it up off of the music culture, for example, mm -hmm. versus somebody who uses that to exploit the kid. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. How do you sort that out? That's my whole point about Miriam. You refer. Mm -hmm. Let the people who do this every single day figure it out. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think that's a good thing about the uh, police department um, I'm with cl clergy on patrol. And one of the things they are educating the police officers about, you know, the whole picture. You see somebody, and like you say, he's big and he grabs it. For somebody who's been somebody who's been abused, that is like a trigger. Mm -hmm. And so regardless of what you're saying, you know, that's a trigger. Right. And so they're teaching the culture, changing the, the culture and telling them how you approach and having a different different approach. Because mm -hmm. like you say, you don't know what happened in their past. Mm -hmm. So you're like, God, I'm trying, lady, I'm trying to help you. Mm -hmm. Ma'am, I'm trying to find out. And mm -hmm. she don't went postal on you. So you just don't know. Even kids in school, mm -hmm. they will go off, and you know you don't know why. What did I say? I mm -hmm. just was asking you to. They go from pull your zero to a hundred. Or I just asked you to, and they they go 10. off. Yep. I, I'm so glad you mentioned that. That triggers the. In this, one of the interesting things about being in Rochester is the activism and the advocacy. Yes. So there have been instances where cops shot somebody who was mentally ill and acting out because they didn't understand what was going on. And so people within the mental health community, including peer groups, come forward and said, let us train you. Yes. Uh -huh. Same thing happened with the gay and lesbian community. Yes. Uh -huh. Same thing happened with the deaf community. Uh -huh. There were people who were deaf who yeah. were killed yeah. because cops didn't understand. And so when the community comes forward and says, let us work with you Educate. about this, Absolutely. Can I teach you guys a word? Mm-hmm. Instead of saying process, we should say sex work. Sex work. Sex work. Thank you. Um, I, I used to be an HIV test counselor, and I worked with people who did sex work. Um, so sex work is illegal. Um, process, which is sex work. We talk about the same thing, but um, like you were saying, some people may be doing sex work, because of a variety of reasons. Maybe this person has three kids at home. No food, no job. They do sex work. They pay the rent through sex work. They get money through sex work. I'm not saying it's, it's right, but that's what happens. Mm -hmm. So anyway, being an HIV test counselor, some of the women in this program that I used to work at would get arrested for sex work. But instead of punishing them and sending them to jail, they would find out 
more often than not that they were being exploited. They were being, it's called sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. So um, these young women, mostly, that's who they were, they were being pimped out by somebody. Now, okay, 2019, the way sex work is, is you're not really going to pick up somebody off the street. Maybe on Lyle you might, but the way it works is over the internet. Mm -hmm. So there's these sites. It could be through Facebook. It could be, yep. there was this um, Craigslist. Mm -hmm. There was a site that got shut down called Backpage.com. Posting pictures of these young girls in near to nothing. And it's not because they wanted to do it. Somebody was controlling them. Mm -hmm. um, so this program, instead of taking them to jail, we would go into these this classroom and they would get food, they would get, you know, other things that they needed, and they would get lawyers involved. And one thing that I would do is give them HIV testing um, because it's needed. So, like, some people, people back in the day used to say someone's being promiscuous or that girl is being promiscuous being or fast. that girl is being fast, fast, fast or she got hot panties. Right. Um, more often than not, Something happened to that young girl mm -hmm. to make her act out sexually so that because if it keeps happening over and over again, you think that's what your only work, mm -hmm. your body. Mm -hmm. And then that's what you know. Yep. I, can I help? Thank you. Iron sharpens on. Iron yes. sharpens. This is our iron sharpening because I did Six. promise everybody we would be out of here by two. But if I can help Six. really quick to just sum up what she said, if that's okay because this is kind of my little thing. Page 39. <laughs> we, we in the book, we, we let the spirit use us. Yes. <laughs> um, page 39. So it says, a research expert, Larry K. Brown. Are you, you with me? Are you still with yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Larry K. Brown cites data that shows adolescents with the history of sexual abuse are significantly more likely than those who have not to engage in sexual behavior that puts them at risk for HIV infection. This is that in that that's going into that CSC. It says, um, I asked the question, could this be because they have a need to feel loved so much that they engage in risky sexual practices to fulfill a need for love and belonging? They are three times more likely to have a lower impulse, lower impulse control and inconsistent condom use which result in a higher rate of sexually transmitted diseases and unplanned pregnancy. Teenage pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases in the United States is responsible for $17.4 billion of overall health care costs. And of that $17.4 billion, about $3.5 billion is attributed to childhood sexual abuse survivors. Due to the poor economic condition of the survivors, most of the counseling these individuals receive will not address their current sexual behavior or deal with the underlying issues, which is what we just have already said. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I'm sorry, in Maslow's hierarchy, there are needs of self-esteem and self-actualization, which are beyond simple physiological needs and begin to move past the psychological into the needs for self-fulfillment. When the psychological and self-fulfillment needs of the individual are not met within the medical institutions society provides, the results for adolescent survivors of childhood sexual abuse that they, is that they will continue to re-experience anxiety and trauma for years. As previously stated, the individual will often turn to some other method of coping to attempt to satisfy their needs. So when we get to this place of sex trafficking of, what did you say it was? It was sex, sex work. work, things of that nature. They're trying, sometimes they're trying to fulfill a psychological need. Yes. And a lot of times the reason why we have the issues with drugs and with incarceration and things of that nature is because they're trying to fulfill this need so that they have. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Come on in. Thank Who is that? That's your friend. Hey. We're having a seminar, so come on in and have a seat. Speaking of money, if you go to the next slide. Yes. Here we go. <laughs> Ta-da! We practiced. We did practice this. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. So Holy Spirit. They, you're quoting, uh, like, national figures. Right. So a few years ago, the 
Centers for Disease Control. They're based in Atlanta. They, they deal with public health issues like outbreaks, uh, measles outbreaks, mm -hmm. is the, the current one. Right. Um, they did a very interesting study. What is the cost per lifetime of a child who was physically abused, sexually abused, psychologically abused mm -hmm. or neglected. And their baseline was the year 2008. Okay. They couldn't determine, this is published in medical journals, they couldn't determine the cost of health care, either as a child or an adult. <coughs> what they were able to figure out, we live in America, right? Mm -hmm. Money. Money. You got to right? make money. Oh, yeah. Money. What they were able to figure out is what was the productivity loss? They pegged that at $161,000. That's based on 2017 figures. They couldn't figure out the cost of child welfare, criminal justice involvement, or special education. All those services. Mm -hmm. But the overall figure they came up with, so it's a conservative one, over two hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So if you think about the impact on a person's life, yeah, that that's serious stuff. We don't practice prevention in this country. Mm -hmm. We deal with things after the fact. Mm -hmm. But to begin to talk about, put a number on it. Now we've got legislators' attention. Okay. Now, having said, this is the kind of results that typically happen to people who go through these ACEs, childhood sexual abuse. Here's dump number seven. Don't impose on a particular victim a rigid set of norms or expectations for how that person is going to act, feel, or think. Mm -hmm. Because clinical studies of a group of survivors can't predict how one specific person will respond. How many in here claim to be a Methodist? I've worked for the Methodists. I've been paid by the Methodists. I'm not Methodist. Mm -hmm. I've got a whole host of ideas about what Methodists are like. Mm -hmm. They like food. And we start on time and we end on time. <laughs> She's a typical Methodist. No, I just work for them. <laughs> She's learned. She's learned. She's learned. She's been trained. I've been a great student. Good coping. <laughs> coping. And yes, we like to eat. <laughs> but Laura, I know, is a long time method. Right? <laughs> but that doesn't mean that that's how Laura is going to function as a method. That's right. That's right. So I need to keep that stuff in my head about the potential kind of things, about these ACEs, about the stuff that was just being cited in right. the book that you're getting a copy of. But I like it where Paul says, work out your, your own salvation. salvation. Yeah, God. With fear and trembling. Your own salvation. Your own salvation. So yeah. when that survivor discloses to me, I've got all this stuff in my head, but I'm dealing with a specific person right in front of me. Mm -hmm. yes. Where is he strong? Where is he weak? Who is for him? Who is right. against him? Who else is he told? Who is he afraid of telling? Right. I need to personalize it. So go to next the one. next one. Do. Do recognize and accept the disclosure of childhood sexual abuse. And you all said this earlier. Mm -hmm. Why a child is more likely to be a process than an event. Mm -hmm. It takes time for the details of the story to emerge. You don't get it all at once. That's the exception. Mm -hmm. So affirm that person who comes forward. Come back to this end. <laughs> Your name. Ray. I haven't picked on Ray since before he had lunch. So he's all comfortable. He's all warm and cozy. His guard is down. So when Ray comes forward and discloses to me, even if it's a little bit, I'm going to say, that was a brave thing to do. That was the right thing to do. That's what we at New Horizon 
cherish. Mm -hmm. Thank you. God bless you. Mm -hmm. Do I walk out of there with a whole bunch of questions? You didn't tell me this. What about that? I'm going to affirm and affirm and affirm you. Matthew's Gospel. The woman who's been bleeding for 12 years approaches Jesus. Does she come at him face on? No. How does she approach him? She's uh, she's down. She's on her knees from she's behind. Her from behind. From behind. Does she see his face? No. Does he see her face? No. Does she call out his name? No. What does she do? She touches, she touches him. Yeah. Touches his garment. And then what happens? All the virtue went out of him. Yeah. That was one thing that happened. He said, who touched, who touched me? She was healed. She was healed, she though. She was healed. Mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't ask 400 questions. But who are you? Where are you from? Right. What's your problem? How much money you got? <laughs> She'd already what's spent all her money. She spent the, What's your profession? On what, medical. What's your insurance provider? Right. Yeah. Right. 17 billion. Yeah. <laughs> that was enough. <laughs> That she approached him, that she disclosed to him she was in need. Right. However indirect, that was enough for Jesus. That's right. That's right. Okay? Yep. Next. Why do servers, survivors. survivors delay in telling? These are examples from congregations. It could be we don't make it safe for people to come forward. We don't talk about it. It could be I don't have the language for it. Mm -hmm. What this is, is where the perpetrator is a factor. So think about <coughs> the abuser as somebody who is well known to the kid. Mm -hmm. The perpetrator imposes secrecy and threat of harm to the child, the child's family, the child's pet. <coughs> Ray, if you go forward to your pastor, mm -hmm. I know you've got that dog at home. I know what that dog looks like. Tell that to a seven-year-old. The religious threat. God will not forgive you. You're no longer a virgin. I'll tell how you sin. Mm -hmm. The blame goes onto the kid. You are so irresistible. You wanted this. You enjoyed this. You made me do it. Right. If you read the stories of those males who came forward having described abused by Catholic priests, as Reverend Walker was talking about, right. you read stories where priests are quoted blaming the kid. He was seducted. He seduced me. 13-year-old kid. One of the predators in that Methodist missionary situation said to the girl, I can teach you what men like. This will help you get a boyfriend. This is special. No one will believe you. They'll hate you for lying. They trust me. I'm a man of God. I'm older, smarter, and stronger. Power, power, power. Dependency for rewards. We talked about this earlier. Attention, support, material items. The, the gentleman who was sitting on the stool talked about that. I'm not going to read it out loud, but there's a reference to that. It's in Genesis 34. Jacob, um, Jacob's sons, and I don't know if you know the story of Dinah. Dinah, I think her name was, who was raped by, they were in a different, and he says, I wanted her, so I took her. And then he tried to come back and tried to appease the sons, you know. And so these are, earlier where you and Dr. Walker were talking about, these are the narratives that we need to bring, me as a person, personally, as a preacher, to bring to the pulpit mm -hmm. so that the discussion can start. A lot of these six stories that are already in the Bible are not talked about. They're not preached. And so therefore there's no um, foundation or no ground for that kind of, for, so, so then our ministers can even have those conversations because they're not coming from the pulpit. Right. So I just wanted to let you know, and then that's on page uh, 25. <laughs> yes. And these may not even necessarily be said because, especially when you're dealing with somebody in power or when you're dealing with somebody in the type of 
office, for lack of a better word, of a preacher, a teacher, this is, you know, they are somebody that people are supposed to trust. Mm -hmm. They are somebody that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a lover of crime shows and cop shows, and they are the ones you say, okay, we've got this person and we've got that person, which one are we going to believe? Mm -hmm. And they're going to inherently believe the person in a position of trust. So it may not even necessarily be said, but the child or even, you know, the woman thinks that way. It, it, absolutely. Where the insidious things, just evil things. Um, this is from Methodist missionary children in the Congo. A lot of these kids had siblings. So if one of the kids is gets these kind of messages, you better believe that the siblings are likely to hear about it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next. Next. Eight. Do not break a promise you've made. It can result in re-victimization, mm -hmm. another betrayal, another broken trust. We risk being perceived as hypocrites. Mm -hmm. Over the weekend, I received mail, email from a survivor from a investigation that was concluded in 2010 in the church. His church had promised counseling support. They had acknowledged responsibility. So he started last June corresponding, saying, I'm ready to come forward. Ten years later, I'm ready to come forward. What do I need to do? Well, you need to submit the invoices, the bills from your therapist. You need this, this, and this. He submitted them. It turns out it was the legal counsel of the denomination handling. Weeks went by. He never heard. Just never heard anything. He tried again. I had offered to help him if he needed it. He comes to me. Now, he's having to go get help. How do you think that makes him, as a grown man, feel? Mm -hmm. That he can't even get a response. Mm. I know the people involved. I pick up the phone. Did you get his stuff? And if you're going to respond, when are you going to respond? Right. And if you got his stuff, is it sufficient? And if you treat him this way, is this a pattern that you're going to treat others who come forward this way? Because I tell you, I still get people contact. Within 30 minutes, they replied to him. They said, yes, we're processing it. Mm -hmm. Well, he felt good on the one hand that he could twist my dial and get me to move. Mm. But at another you know, I had to keep my promise because the denomination was breaking their promise to me. Right. So it was really important that I keep my promise. Jesus says, <coughs> this is about hypocrites. Whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead. Yes. That's what a hypocrite is hypocrite. to Jesus. Right. When we break promises, yes. we are whitewashed too. That's right. Do you keep a promise you've made? It preserves trust. It's a relational way to demonstrate the power of God's abiding love and the integrity of those who follow Jesus Christ. Keep the covenant. Be faithful to the promise. I cannot tell you how many times I've had the survivor say, He abused me, he's sick, he needs help. But he works for the church, and he didn't come through for me. He does it in the name of Jesus Christ. He has no excuse. Mm -hmm. Which hurts more? The church. The church. They didn't do anything. Right. There's a different expectation. Or they knew, and they, and they didn't do anything. They knew, and they didn't do anything. Know them by their fruits. 
Not our behavior, but the fruits, which are the results for the survival. That's right. Okay. That's why the church is struggling. Now, this... That's why the church is struggling today, because Amen. there's a lot of portrayal. When they needed help, they did not get it from the church, and now they're saying the millennials are not coming to church or not. Well, who helped the millennials when they needed help? Who protected them? Yep. So now you're saying, so you're sitting up there preaching Jesus, and it's like, okay, well, you know, where was the help? So the work is, is you got to do that reverse psychology, and you got to meet them where they're at right now. Mm -hmm. And other than that, yes, the church will die. Yeah. Because they've been portrayed so much. And we do it to ourselves. Yes. We do it, we're killing ourselves, right. So the last two of these, this, this is where um, I didn't stick to the topic. This is about prevention. Nine? Yep. And we've touched on this mm -hmm. from early on. God bless you. Don't avoid, don't deny, and don't minimize the reality or the nature of child sexual abuse. Don't perpetuate a silence which communicates the message that the congregation is unable or unwilling to deal with the disclosure. Jesus says, Matthew 25, we don't respond to people who are hungry, thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, the imprisoned, yeah, yeah. and we're missing him before us. Mm -hmm. So who are we talking about in terms of survivors? People who are hungry for the truth to be told. For justice. Yeah. For justice to be done. Who are thirsty for healing and recovery. Yeah, God. Who are alienated yes. and shunned. Yes. Who have been exposed and are vulnerable. In body, mind, and spirit, imprisoned by fear, guilt, and self doubt. That's mm -hmm. the don't. That's it. Yeah. And That's the good. do prevention. When we talk about disclosure, we're in the intervention phase. Mm -hmm. Something has happened, and the issue is how do we respond? Postvention is after it's over. Can we sit down and learn the lessons? What we, did we do well? Where, where did we blow it? Mm -hmm. So prevention phase. Prepare to it's wait. It's not only New Testament. It goes back to the prophet Isaiah. Mm -hmm. I get excited quoting prophets. Mm -hmm. Prepare the way. Prevention is about preparing the way. Mm -hmm. Do make the congregation a safe place for disclosure through prevention me measures. Here we go. Educate. Mm -hmm. I paid the pastor to talk about the stories in the scripture which we do not talk about. <laughs> when I, when you hand out the book, and the first thing I did is go to the sources mm -hmm. and I see Phyllis Tribble. Yeah. I think I'm in the right place. Yeah. When was the last time you heard a sermon about some of these biblical stories? We, we don't talk about them. We do not talk about them. Do we pray for people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, about policies and procedures. How do you, how do you entrust kids? Mm -hmm. Well, one, one way is to say, what are your policies and what are your procedures? Mm -hmm. What do you do if? Mm -hmm. What do you do with? Yeah. I guarantee you that people who've been sued, if you've got a bishop, chances are your church has been sued. Those of us who don't have bishops, we're hard to sue. Mm -hmm. It's about accountability. It's about accountability. Mm -hmm. If I've got one finger, pointed at that predator, I've got three pointed back at me. Mm -hmm. What did I do in advance? And implement it. There's all kinds of wonderful things on paper. You do it. Mm -hmm. yes. Ezekiel 34 is all about mm -hmm. what the true shepherd is in terms of taking care of the flock which is vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Getting to the end. Don't yield to the temptation to avoid tension, stress, disruption, or conflict in a congregation by discouraging disclosure of CSA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Reverend Walker preaches about sexuality. Woo -woo. 
the deacons are notified. That was my question. Yeah. <laughs> this man is not typical of how clergy do things. He breaks the silence and then says, oh yeah, I've touched a nerve. <laughs> we can keep going. Yeah, keep touching it. That was my question. <laughs> Not afraid to grab a hold of the third rail. It's <laughs> a big rail. It's a big rail. <clears throat> Jeremiah. God says, They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, Peace, peace. When there is no peace. When there is no peace. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the don't. What's the last do? Do embrace the survivor's disclosure as a gift. Mm -hmm. Per his risk in coming forward to you disrupts the denial yeah, yeah. and silence, and it makes a place for God's Spirit to work. Is it going to be messy? Yes. Are you going to get letters? Are the deacons going to come calling? Yep. Was it parish, pastor? SPRC? Yeah. Relations committee? Yep. Yep. Yeah, we got one of those. I think we do. <laughs> I say, great, that's a teachable moment. That's a teachable moment. Let's right. talk about this. this. This does not project well at all. It's okay. This is the angel of the Lord. Here are the people with all kinds of physical Lane. afflictions. Mm -hmm. This is at the sheep gate outside Jerusalem. <laughs> this is the pool of... Bethesda, I think, or Bethsaida, Bethsaida. Bethsaida, Salome. Salome, yeah. When does the healing come? When you get in the water. It only comes when you get in the water, but when do you have to get in the water? After the angel when troubles. It's stirred up. After, it's After the angel stirs it up. Mm -hmm. I love the spiritual, God's going to trouble the waters. Wade in the waters. Wade in the waters. I love it. The angel of the Lord, that is a Survivor coming forward disclosing. Mm -hmm. Troubling the waters because that's where the healing is going to come. Yeah, Not only good. healing for the survivor, but healing for we as the people of Jesus Christ. Yes. Last slide. One more. Finally, what counts is not you're obeying ten specific do nots or ten practical do's. That's illegalism. That's being like Pharisees, right? The letter of the law. That's not what we need. We need that, but we need more. We need a culture, a community, a people who cherish the spirit of Jesus saying, let the little children come to me. Because children have a God-given right to be safe and well in body, mind, and soul. Reverend Walker, to my dying day, I'll be grateful for you for invoking the UN Charter mm -hmm. on the Rights of Children. Hey. We don't talk about the rights of children. That's right. Though. We don't talk about the God-given rights, right. the yeah. inherent. Mm -hmm. oh. God-given right to be safe and well in body, mind, and soul. Mm -hmm. We need a culture that commits its resources to ensure their well-being. Yes. <clears throat> I give thanks to God for you, for caring, and for acting. I'm, there's no finish. I'm just stopping. That's okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I just would like to thank Reverend Jim for his awesomeness today. He has given us a lot of information. Thank you, Dr. Walker, for 13, 14 years of work for the with the Rochester area of initiating this Rochester area child abuse abuse network and so um, we at New Horizon now that I have emerged as a pastor and now have a little more say over what actually happens because a lot of times what we find is that a lot of pastors are not willing to open up their churches or their congregations but that is not the case here we are willing to open up our doors to set up something like this and if we have to make sandwiches we will make sandwiches but this is going to be an open forum our goal here at New Horizon uh, Faith Center is to equip, educate, and empower, and evangelize. Um, we want to reach the world. We want to equip the saints to evangelize the nations. We want to make sure that we are willing and ready to respond to what is getting ready to come through our doors. One of the things about me is I feel this shift moving. 
I feel what's happening with everything that is happening in our government, with everything that is happening with the laws changing, with the elections being moved up, with a lot of things that are happening. Our primary election has been moved up. Last, what was it, last month we had Dr. McMickle here to do a seminar on pulpit politics and preachers. So that would educate and equip our preachers on our involvement in politics. We need to know how to address these things that are happening, how to educate our community. Dr. Walker, I'm going to ask him to come back and tell us about how over the years the church has been a pillar. I remember this from when he talked about Absalom Jones and Richard Allen and all of the, the movements that happened during <clears throat> those times, how the church has always been the foundation or the place where people would come to get their education, they would come to get the news. They would come to get training. We are, I, I am so adamant about rekindling that spirit yes. because a lot of people are going to a lot of different places to get their information. And once again, we know what's the, the dangers of the Internet. Not everything on the Internet is true. So we need to come to places where we can get some real solid, good information. And if it's just us, invite people to come. Encourage people. Bring one other person other than yourself. Just one. And, you know, we'll have plenty. As you can see, we've had plenty of food. We have to end up taking food home all the time. So, you know, we'll be, you'll be full spiritually and psychologically. You'll be full physically. All of those needs. God, my God, shall supply all of your needs, right, according to his riches in glory. So we want to just thank you again, Dr. Walker. Thank you again, Reverend Jim, for an awesome presentation. Yes. Um, and thank you for coming, for having enough in your hearts to want to hear this. Was this helpful information? Yes. yes? Good. Good. We will be having a um, no, next month, March 16th. We're trying to do one of these a month. Something once time, one Saturday a month. Next month, we will have um, mental health, the church and community. So we're kind of just, the Lord is kind of putting this series, church and community. The church and community um, will be responding to mental health issues or mental, I'm sorry, Mental, it's not mental health issues. What is it? What is our term? Mental, oh my gosh. It's not mental health. It's the, it's the same, I'm saying the same thing, but it's different. It's not mental health. Nope, not mental hygiene. Mental illness? Me, thank you. Oh. <laughs> it's not mental health, it's mental illness. So yes. we'll be responding to identifying being able to identify mental illness. Mm -hmm. At least we're not professionals, but at certain times when we are praying at the altar, is this an outburst? Is this, is this some type of touch yes. that you did that triggered something in somebody's mind that caused them to act out? We think it's the Holy Spirit, but really it's a, a breakdown, right? Mm -hmm. And so we inside. need to be able to just identify mental illness in the church. So the church and community responding to mental illness, that is March the 16th, and so it's, it's free. Um, we ask, you know, it's free will offering. If you have a free will offering, but we will be doing that. So let's uh, have, uh, we need to dismiss. We need to dismiss. We want to, do I turn it back or we want to dismiss? You want to? Sure. Um, thank you so much. It's very good. Although this is a small religious assembly, it's very important that you continue to follow the dictates of the person who has the vision to do what you think and feel and know that is correct in the eyes of God. Mm -hmm. um, if the tr world is full of nastiness, that nastiness